Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And um, apologize that this seems a, a little unusual for such a timely, rapid start for an IGF um, MAG meeting. But we're very honored today to have the Under Secretary General for UNDESA here with us for the first half hour or so. So we really wanted to be able to um, maximize his time here. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many people here. This is our second preparatory meeting for IGF 2016. And um, so many, happy to see so many people for the open consultation specifically. And I'm also very hopeful that we have um, a lot of uh, participants online as well. So um, as I said, this is the, the, our second face-to-face -face meeting in the preparatory session. Specifically, it's the open consultation day, which is when we really want to hear from the community. Um, so in that sense, I prioritize contributions from uh, non-MAG members. And uh, I will probably relax that rule fairly significantly for the session this afternoon on the retreat, um, since that clearly impacts everyone and it's a substantial amount of time. But for most of the other sessions, I really want to prioritize comments from um, uh, all the other um, community participants. Our first order of business is adoption of the agenda, which I hope will be up on the screen soon. It was published a few weeks ago as a draft. There were some um, very helpful comments that came in. The agenda was updated and republished approximately a week ago. Um, we don't have it there, but this morning is actually um, focused on, um, as I said, the first um, item of business is a, a welcoming comment um, from Mr. Wu, Under Secretary General. And then we'll have a welcome from Victor Lagunas, the uh, host country chair for IGF 2016. Um, we then quite quickly go into a briefing on the state of preparations from uh, both the IGF secretariat and the host country, covering workshop proposals, the open forums, dynamic coalitions, other proposals, uh, discussion on the status of the day zero events, and um, a main thematic sessions um, overview. And then later in the morning, we'll actually have updates from the best practice forums and the major intersessional project called the Policy Options for Connecting and Enabling the Next Billions. Um, we will conclude the morning with updates from the national and regional IGF initiatives and then the dynamic coalitions. And in the afternoon, as I said, we'll, we'll come back and have um, quite a lengthy discussion on the retreat on advancing the 10-year mandate of the IGF. Well then, um, we do that for about an hour and a half, and then we have um, requests for a series of other briefings from uh, other uh, intergovernmental organizations specifically. As you know, one of the um, uh, goals for the IGF is to increase uh, collaboration and participation with many other uh, types of organizations, and we've got um, five or six uh, requests for specific um, brief speaking slots to talk about some of their activities and of course the floor is open for comments from other stakeholders as well. And then we left uh, the last 45 minutes um, basically as an open discussion so we can continue on with the retreat discussion um, if that should be of interest or any other topics that the community would like to bring up. So with that I'd like to move for adoption of the agenda and we'll look to see if there are any Comments against? Seeing none, I'd call the agenda adopted. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Under Secretary General, Mr. Wu. Thank you. Ms. Lin and Santama, Chairperson of the Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group. Distinguished members, of the MAC, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the multi-stakeholder advisory group, MAC, of the Internet Governance Forum. A warm welcome also to IGF community representatives who are here with us at the opening consultations, either in person or through remote participation. 
Indeed, remote participation through webcast or live transcript demonstrates that IGF inclusiveness, which is part of the IGF's mandate, established in the Tunis agenda. I would like to, to take this opportunity to reaffirm the United Nations commitment to strengthen the multi-stakeholder engagement in internet governance. In this regard, I would also like to applaud the efforts of MAG in seeking to increase participation of all relevant stakeholders, especially from the developing countries. Let me use this occasion to say a few words about the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, also known as DESA. DESA is the Secretary Department at headquarters with the mandates for servicing UN intergovernment bodies and the processes, such as the General Assembly, the Economic and the Social Council, and its functional commissions and expert committees. Our analytical and the capacity building work covers a range of areas, including microeconomic analysis, financing for development, population dynamics, statistics, public administration, social development, and sustainable development. DESA also serves as the secretariat for many processes, including, as many, as many of you recall, the General Assembly WISIS Plus 10 review last December. As a headquarter-based secretariat department, DESA is often asked by the Secretary General to manage and administer support for a number of initiatives of the Secretary General himself, including the Internet Governance Forum, conveyed by the Secretary General in response to the mandate of the Tunis Agenda. One of my predecessors, Mr. Nitin Desai, chaired the MAC meetings in its first phase and helped establish the working modalities of the MAC. We have helped foster the growth of IGF in the past 10 years, and we will continue doing so together with you in the next decade. We embarked on the IGF journey together, and we are ready to work with all of you to further strengthen the IGF while continuing to improve its working modalities as called for by WISIS Plus 10. We are aware that the MAC is, by its very nature, a diverse community representing different perspectives. In my view, this is a key feature of IGM, IGF. This diversity can also be enriching, as seen in the 260 workshop proposals received for the 2016 IGF, featuring 66 topics. The theme that the MAC proposed for the 2016 IGF, namely on enabling inclusive and sustainable growth, is timely 
and forward-looking. Last year, world leaders adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, anchored in 17 universal and interconnected Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets. As you know, the 2030 Agenda underscores that the Internet and the information and the communication technologies can play enabling roles in implementing the SDGs and the associated targets. More specifically, one of the SD tar targets calls for efforts to significantly increase access to information and communication technologies and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the Internet in least developed countries by 2020. Here I would like to draw your attention. When we talk about Agenda 2030, we take it for granted all the targets or goals should be reached by the year 2030, still some 14 years away. However, some of the goals and targets have a deadline in 2020 or 2025, which means we do not have that luxury of 15 or 14 years. There's a strong sense of urgency. As it happens, the high-level political forum, which is the central platform for follow-up and review of SDGs, is taking place here this week and the next. You are welcome to follow the discussions. It is also timely that that retreat will be held later this week to explore ways to enrich the IGF. As a part of the ongoing process in advancing the IGF mandates, the 2016 IGF marks the first IGF following its 10th year renewal by the General Assembly at the WISIS Plus 10 high-level event last year. For the past 10 years, MAC members, together with the various stakeholders of the IGF community, have contributed tremendously to IGF's dialogue process. Your efforts have made profound impacts on the state of Internet governance today. We need to think how the IGF can further enhance its role as the global forum for multi-stakeholder policy discussion on public policy issues related to key elements of Internet governance. Here I'll be thinking aloud, what would happen in the next 15 years? If you look at Agenda 2030, it is the first time that the human beings throughout the world realized one reality. Our current way of consumption, current way of production, are not sustainable. This is the common ground for reaching consensus by 193 member states of the United Nations, with each has its own domestic priority. So I would imagine it would be wonderful if the priority for internet governance in the next 15 years could have a focus on promotion of implementation 
of sustainable development goals. That will be very significant and will be welcomed by the international community as a whole. And secondly, if you look back the last 10 years, we have been discussing a lot of issues. Some of them are very sensitive. The positions of different stakeholders are really far apart. Are we repeating the same discussions with no conclusion in sight for the next 10 years? Is there a better way to do it, to do something meaningful for international community, for multi-stakeholders, and for everybody? I would say that not all the areas that we differ. There are areas, positions and views of various multi-stakeholders are very close to each other. Is that possible for us to start with the easy ones? To have some early harvest by producing some policy recommendations to the governments and to the business. So we could guide the intergovernmental internet governance in the next 10 years. So just some, some ideas for, for the uh, retreat. I encourage all MAC members and IGF stakeholders to contribute your inputs to guide the retreat discussions. Any idea or suggestion coming out from the retreat will in return, it will in turn be shared with the broader IGF community for further consultation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are less than five months for the 11th IGF meeting in Guadalajara, Mexico. I'm glad to know that the preparations for this meeting are well underway, drawing on good lessons learned from the past IGF meetings. The intersessional work of the IGF in various tracks, such as the Best Practice Forum, Dynamic Coalitions, and the Policy Note on connecting and enabling the next billing have been well received by the IGF community. Here I would like to thank the MAC Chair and Lim and the members and MAC members and also the host country of Mexico for your leadership, commitment and for the solid preparatory work Done so far. But I'm also aware that the MAC has very challenging tasks ahead, including the need to evaluate over 260 workshop proposals and 45 open forum proposals, the most that the IGF has ever received. I'm confident that you will adopt a balanced approach on the wide array of topics on internet governance, taking into account the diversity across stakeholders groups, geographical representation and agenda. The remarkable growth of national and regional IGF initiatives also speaks well on the global relevance of the IGF. We should explore concrete ways to enhance linkages and the leverage of synergies among them and with the IGF. We'd also like to extend capacity development efforts to reach out to those in need. Let us aim for another great year for the 
IGF in Mexico. In enriching policy dialogue for the internet to empower sustainable development for all on this shared planet. I look forward to your active engagement and the productive outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wu. Um, we thought we would spend the next 10 minutes with um, a high-level update on the preparations for IGF Mexico, as that was a, a topic of, of interest to the Under Secretary General, and then we will um, come back and hit some of those same topics in a little more depth later. So with that, I'd like to introduce Victor Lagunas, who's the Honorary Host Country Chair, and he's the Chief Information Officer, the Head of Unit for Innovation and Technology Strategy, and the Office of the President of the Republic of Mexico. So, Victor, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, very fortunate, very thankful, uh, Under Secretary, uh, to be here um, presenting the, the development of all the work that the MAC has been doing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Masago, as well, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to first uh, would like to recognize the work of uh, of the MAG, and uh, it's been quite uh, an impressive uh, journey so far. And uh, looking into the last months, we still have uh, some way to go yet. We're feeling very um, very um, comfortable that this this is going to be a, a very strong and very um, open uh, governance forum. The 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 dates in Mexico have, have been set. Uh, we're looking into the, the December 6th to, the, to, to December the 9th in the city of Guadalajara. Um, and as the date approaches, um, we are definitely considering all the topics from the technical to the human rights. Um, we're very, we're very um, excited to know that the workshops, the number of workshops submitted has, um, has, has an all-time record. So that means that the interest um, of, of continuing the discussion is there. And uh, in countries such as Mexico, this, this, comes at, this cannot come at a better time. Um, Mexico, has, it's a country of a little bit more than 120 million people, um, slightly more than 50% connected. Um, we're taking strides towards uh, connectivity and bridging that digital divide. We're a very young country still with a median age of 27 years. We're trying to take advantage of connectivity and really the use of internet to give our young the opportunity to be, um, to, uh, to access uh, the global knowledge network. Um, within that, we, um, we recognize, as you said, Under Secretary, the, that access to ICTs is the um, the great differentiator, and also um, as, a, as as one of the sustainable development goals, um, it's it underlines the um, the relevance and the importance of being connected towards um, being able to achieve those goals set out in the 2030 agenda. Um, we even set out in Mexico the access to internet as a constitutional right. This aligns um, all the, diff the different ecosystem and the multi-stakeholder ecosystem towards a single goal, which is give our country the, the, the access to, um, to internet. Our focus going into the 2016 uh, governance forum is to host um, an inclusive and, and, um, and and, and focus on sustainable development. What we want to achieve is um, really activate our young people and also our industry, as well as the academic and technical sector in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, in a country such as Mexico, the, the voices are loud, yet the ecosystem is still under development. We want to have an open uh, forum, an open discussion, and we believe this forum actually presents the, the, the great a great opportunity for us to not only uh, strengthen the ecosystem in Mexico, but present a, a good opportunity for all of us to discuss those topics that are necessary. 
Thank you so much, Undersecretary. So I'd like to just thank, um, again, Undersecretary General, Mr. Wu, um, for making some time this morning. As many of you know, this is a very busy week here at the UN with the um, HLPF and obviously all of its normal activities as well. So we'll just take a moment and um, thank you again. And thank you. Thank, thank you. If you just give us a moment while we get settled here, and I guess you just saw the, the um, one of the interesting elements of having a non-governmental person as the magic <laughs> chair, trying to understand UN protocol. Um, okay, so we all settled here then. Um, let me just go back to a, maybe a slightly less breathless pace here for a moment. Um, and before we continue on with the presentations from um, Victor and then from the IGF Secretariat on the preparations for IGF 16, I just want to um, address a couple of comments I heard with respect to the place cards here in the room. Um, I mean, I think they're very nice and they're electronic. Um, everybody is seated according to alphabetical order. There evidently is no way to do anything different unless we take the name tags down entirely, which would certainly allow people to sit where they want to sit. But then we lose what I think is a very great advantage of identification for those that don't know everybody by name and voice. So I checked with a few people offline because I said there was some, some discomfort with this arrangement. Um, I leave it to the room. If the room would prefer not to have the automated place cards and freedom to sit where you like, we could certainly do that. I'd suggest um, taking a kind of a straw poll in a moment. Or we leave it as it is, which again, there was no ulterior motives here. It's by alphabetical order. So any, any comments from the floor with respect to that? Because I said it was quite a point of concern. So, And um, just again, uh, Changatai is going to keep the queue. For those people that are participating online, Changatai will be informed when there's an online um, a request from an online participant. And those participants are slotted into the queue at the time the request is made. It might not all, always be obvious if there are five, six, seven folks ahead of you in the queue, but we are absolutely not holding those um, comments to the end. They are slotted in the queue at the time the request comes in. So I'm not sure if, if Changatai caught the current queue, but I saw Marilyn Chip and Michael. Marilyn, you have the floor. Welcome um, the opportunity to meet here and thank you, um, Victor, for the update comments and also to Undersecretary Wu for his comments. I actually would like to welcome the seating arrangement because it means that we are more widely distributed and probably sitting next to uh, people from other stakeholder groups rather than sitting with our own stakeholder group. So I'm looking at this as a great opportunity to get further acquainted and to uh, create more of a horizontal conversation than a vertical conversation. I also just want to reinforce to me the importance of having the names. Um, some MAG members are relatively new and while this is my third year and I know many of the uh, experienced uh, attendees, I am still meeting the new MAG members and getting acquainted with them, and I think that it is important to have the name identification uh, regardless of what other uh, perhaps innovations we are uh, struggling with. Thank you. Thank you. I think Chip was next in the queue. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Chip Sharp with Cisco Systems. And I thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak and uh, look forward to a good discussion today. Uh, might I suggest that 
for the consultation day uh, that we have no name tags and no, uh, no seat reservations uh, so that we can all kind of sit, you know, at the same level, uh, I think you might say. Uh, you know, having the non-MAG members and, you know, kind of move to the back of the room is not, you know, conducive to their uh, input. So I just like, I don't suppose we do that now because I think it would be too disruptive to get up and move everybody around, but to maybe in the future consultations, you consider an alternate arrangement. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Mike Nelson, you have the floor. The thing that Marilyn just said, um, which is that I really welcome having the name tags. The only recommendation I would make is that perhaps each of the three days we can shuffle the names around so that different people are in different places so that we maximize the opportunity to talk to different people. But as, as somebody who does not memorize names easily, I really appreciate having the names in front of me. And I, and I, and I take Chip's point, but I think a lot of us actually prefer to be in the back of the room, which is another reason I'd like to be shuffled around. Thank you, Michael. I'm sorry, the gentleman in the back of the room, I can't see your name tag. Thank you, uh, Richard Jordan from the Royal Academy of Science International Trust. As someone who has been here at the UN every day for 36 years, um, just let me uh, make a comment about the, the electronic signage. Uh, the electronic signage uh, today reflects more the Science, Technology and Innovation Forum that was held under the aegis of ECOSOC on June 6th and 7th here in the building. Um, and it does not mean that member states are all in the front and uh, then uh, programs and agencies and then observers or MAG members. So actually this signage uh, reflects more a, uh, a, an innovation uh, that the Economic and Social Council has uh, put forth. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see anybody else in the queue, and I think at this point, um, I'm assuming that people are happy enough with the situation as is, even if they didn't um, speak up. Um, Chip, if it really is sort of concerning for you, I know there are a couple of MAG members that weren't able to come. Um, you could certainly come up front and maybe just drape a piece of paper over uh, their particular nameplate and uh, feel like you're more a part of the, the conversation, if that works for you. You can change the name, sign. Or apparently we can change the name sign if you choose somewhere else. But um, I thank everybody for their, for their comments. And um, I'm glad we managed to get through that uh, uh, administrative um, quite quickly so we can move back to the agenda. So I think with that, we'll turn to um, Victor again. Um, Victor actually has a uh, lengthier update on the preparations for IGF 2016. We'll go through that, and then we'll actually hear um, from the IGF Secretariat on the preparations as well. So for those following online, we're now moving to the agenda item number four. Thank you, Victor. You have the floor. So, Madam Chair, I was told that uh, the, pres the presentation couldn't, uh, couldn't project. So is that something where we can f fix uh, quickly, or could we... Yes. Mm -hmm. So could we jump into another uh, topic and then come back? Just a verbal update. Yeah, of course. Of course. Or, oh, why don't we have Changi Tai go first then? Hmm. So we'll. Yeah, sure. Changi Tai has volunteered to um, move the IGF Secretariat update forward, and we'll come back to the um, continuation of the presentation from Mexico. Thank you, Changi Tai. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, first of all, just a few um, housekeeping things. Um, in the IGF Secretariat, we have um, brought on a board uh, three consultants to help with the uh, two to help with the best practice forum. So we have um, Anri van der Spy over there. Can you please just stand up so everybody can see you? Um, so she'll be dealing with the um, gender and access and also connecting the next billion. And then we have Wim over there, and he's dealing with IP version, uh, version 6 and also IXPs, correct? Right. And to my right here, we have Anya, who is going to be the IGF focal point for um, national and regional initiatives. Just wave your hands so people know who you are. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. 
Okay, um, so uh, we have more staff and that's um, good for the run up to the um, annual meeting and also for the intercessional work. Thanks. Um, last night, um, thank you all for those who um, did their evaluations. I think this year we've had the most people, most MAG members who um, handed in the evaluations. I know it's a, a lot of work and especially for some of you it was during a holiday weekend. Um, July 4th, and um, thank you very much. Doubly thank you for the efforts. I think we had how many? 40? 43 MAG members that actually um, handed in the evaluations, which I think is uh, much improved from last year. Um, as you know, there were 260, roughly 260 um, proposals I sent out a um, email last night um, with a breakdown of the proposals and also of the marks. I won't get into the um, actual details whether we're going to choose the top 65, 85. Um, we'll leave that for tomorrow for a more in-depth discussion on how we're going to proceed. And also for your ideas, we just give you some time um, for you to go through the Excel file and also through the um, PowerPoint presentation that we um, attached to it. Uh, but just generally speaking, um, for the proposals, I'm starting on the slide number eight for the general proposals here. Um, the slide number eight just shows you the thematic tags. This year we did it differently. Instead of choosing the themes, um, we said that people can put in the thematic tags. And the highest one was, um, the most chosen was human rights online, and then came access and diversity, internet and ICTs for sustainable development goals going down. For those who aren't MAG members, we are going to put um, these three slides up on the website so um, you can also view it. But it wasn't an overwhelming uh, majority, I think. Um, 19 percent, well, 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 well you, you can say so. Uh, a fifth of them chose um, human rights online to, um, as a descriptor for their um, workshop proposal. And then access and diversity, 15 percent. Internet and ICTs for the sustainable development goals was 15.4 percent. I won't go all the way down. Um, uh, you can read them in your own time. Um, for the session types, um, that's slide number nine, we had um, a big majority for others, which is 26%. Um, uh, others, breakout group discussions was um, also 20%. Panel, um, that's the normal panel, 18%. Debate, 14%. And birds of a feather, uh, 13%. I would just like to reiterate that for this year, we do have a, cons a constraint in how the rooms are shaped, so we can't have that many round table discussions. I mean, we can have a quasi um, round table discussion room layout, but not a full round table room layout. And uh, depending on the results, of the workshop um, selection process that we're going to do tomorrow and the day after, or we'll see how we can um, assign the workshop to the rooms, but we we'll, should be able to do something. That shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, for slide number 10, we can see that um, for proposers, I'm sorry, but we can't really show um, the slides at the moment, but it's fine. Um, Developed country uh, was 54% and developing country was 46%, which is also a marked improvement from last year. So we are making progress in encouraging people from developing countries um, to uh, propose workshops. And returning, 47%. So we had um, first-time proposers is um, 43%. So this is first-time new proposers. Of course, you know, people may try and game the system a little bit and be the second proposers and have um, the first time in the first proposal. But still, that's fine because the first time proposers are learning and um, next year round, they, they can propose by themselves. So it's not actually a bad thing as such. And as usual, we have um, civil society. 
is um, 49%. Uh, uh, so they have the most number of um, proposals that have been proposed. Um, and then the technical community is 20%, private sector 10%, uh, government is 6%, and intergovernmental organizations 5%. I would hazard a guess in saying that these are an improvement from last year. Um, the percentages are a little bit of improvement, but um, the numbers are still low, and we're still trying to um, encourage government um, participation in the workshops, and that's why we are also bringing in the open forums. Um, for the open forums, as we said, um, we whittled down the open forums to 30 from the 44, we had oh, 46 we had, so um, now we've gotten down to 30, and this is mostly governments and uh, intergovernmental organizations to encourage them so that the, the, the numbers even out a little bit more. Um, we have also the five uh, best practice forums and the seven uh, main sessions that we've um, put into the current um, draft um, schedule that we have at the moment, which we'll be trying to fill out after the selection process has um, come. Um, at the moment, we envision, um, this is just to start, of course, the numbers may drastically change afterwards or change slightly, um, depending on what happens in the next two days. Uh, we have 110 um, workshop proposals that we can fit, and these are not, uh, so these are 80, 90-minute workshop proposals, um, five, 60-minute uh, workshop proposals, and 25, 30-minute workshop proposals. We've um, taken these numbers from the um, top 85 or top 65 um, workshop proposals as they've been graded. But um, looking at the data, we may want to make some suggestions and some modifications just so that we have a more balanced um, number of um, workshop proposals according to theme and also according to stakeholder group and um, developer or developing country proposers. Um, I think that's all I can say for the uh, proposals. We, you have the workshop sheet with the standard deviation and variance. Um, we can get into that discussion um, tomorrow. That's what um, tomorrow and the day after is for. Uh, the other um, update from the Secretariat is we've um, opened up for the bilateral Room. So if you want to have a bilateral meeting, please sign up and send an email to um, the IGF Secretariat as the instructions are on the website. And um, also the village booths. If you want um, a, a booth at the village, please send us an um, email and we'll um, put you in on the list. And remember, it is a first come, first serve, so if the room runs out and you haven't sent us an email, then um, it'll be too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Changatai. I think that was an excellent update. Um, I think there was one um, item as well, which is that we believe we actually have a room in the venue which would actually um, support uh, other formats, the pop-up groups or some of the other um, sessions we're looking at that would have the same facilities as all the other workshop rooms. So I think um, we need to determine how best to use that and what to do. That's also um, work over the next couple of days. But I think we were all very pleased to hear that we were able to find an extra room that was a, a proper workshop room and that it will have the same um, streaming facilities and that sort of thing as the other workshop rooms. So I saw a couple of um, requests for the floor. Um, um, Marilyn and Cheryl are the two that I see. Again, um, this is the Open Community Participation Day, so we really do want to hear from those uh, non-MAG members. I do hate anything that starts a descriptor as a non, but, but it's, it's a, a short way of saying we want to hear from the community other than those that are um, currently serving as MAG members. Um, with that, Marilyn, you have the floor, and then Cheryl. Mm -hmm. 
invite um, some of the NOGMAM mem members to also express questions. I have two questions. Um, the first one that I have has to do with flash sessions. I welcome your mentioning that there's a room where perhaps unusual formats could be um, taken into account. There were several um, flash sessions as well as several birds of feather sessions. And um, many of the flash sessions were uh, sole speakers or reporting out on research or interesting projects or initiatives that are very worthwhile, but they certainly do not um, meet all of the criteria, such as uh, providing all views, including all stakeholders, et cetera. So I wonder if we might come back and talk about treating those flash sessions uh, uniquely, uh, piloting, perhaps putting them in a track, um, and uh, seeing whether that also relieves us a little bit uh, in our limitation of space. So that's question number one. And then um, I think question number two I wanted to uh, see when we would have more information about the flexibility of the room design because many of these workshop proposers took our recommendations to heart and provided very creative formats including starting with the panel, moving to breakout session, coming back, doing a summing up. That takes a lot of flexibility in a room. And so I'd just like to park that for when we might come back and talk about it because when we prioritize these workshops, I think it's unfair to um, not give someone a slot if our rooms can't accommodate, and I think we'd have to go back to them and offer them a readjustment. Thank you. Thank you. Those are good points, and we will have more information from um, the Mexican hosts as well, which will uh, partially answer that question. Cheryl, you have the floor. Sorry, <laughs> mic issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank Changatai for the update and also to really thank everyone within the community who submitted proposals. I read um, through all of them and I know that it takes a lot of time and effort to put forward new ideas and I really appreciate that we have so many new people who are contributing and that we have been able to in improve some of the developing country participation as well. I would encourage the folks in the room um, who are throughout the community, and I, I don't like the word non-MAG either, um, if there are things that you saw with the process that we could be improving, or um, if there is anything that we could be doing on our part to make it clearer and easier to submit proposals, uh, I would just encourage a dialogue on that or to somehow ra you know, raise those issues now while you have us all here together. Thank you. Um, just a uh, slight update on the system. This is a new system for me as well. But um, if you want to speak, uh, just indicate on the panel, and then it'll, your name will come up here on, on our panel so that we know which order it is. And if you press the mic to speak, it will flash green first. Just wait, and then it will be red, and then you can speak. Okay. <laughs> how do we insert? Sorry, I'm just asking, how do we insert the online participants in? Um, I think we will just, she can just press hers. Yes, okay. that'll be fine. Okay. I mean, just like I'm doing, so she can Sorry. come in. Oh, I don't know, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, is Miguel in the queue next? <laughs> is that, I'm, I'm still working out the paper here. I'll get somebody to come and um, no. help you out. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we don't have anybody else in the queue. Sorry, there is somebody in the far back. Could you introduce yourself as well? I can't see the... Thank you, Madam Chair. Ritu Sharma with SCG Nexus and Social Media for Nonprofits. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and participate. Um, I would like to propose um, to the MAG, the Internet's Governance Forum, to consider um, an opportunity for the first time attendees, people of color, women, and traditionally underrepresented people to participate at the conference if you have a space available 
in an unconference format where we, they can potentially um, identify and nominate a session there. The, the rigorous submission process can be daunting for some people, and they may not have the confidence and the knowledge to feel uh, empowered to come forward and say, I want to speak and I can pull it off. But if you, have, um, if you have some sort of a mechanism for moderating where you have expert moderators available and you encourage people who haven't spoken and sort of primarily first-time speakers who've never spoken at the conference before and make an open invitation, if you have expertise in this area, we will have moderators supporting you, helping you. I think you'll have a greater diversity of voices because uh, in the last six months that I've been um, engaged in this community, from business forum to ITU forums here to um, ISOC, I can everywhere is the same people uh, speaking, speaking extensively, and uh, at the expense of uh, an opportunity for underrepresented voices to uh, have the confidence and, uh, and preparation to represent themselves and their voices. Thank you. Thank you. We have Nigel in the queue, and I think after Nigel speaks, these are all good comments. I think they would um, also be helped if we were informed a bit more on the uh, the, the specific venue and some of the other considerations uh, for the next YGF. So after Nigel's comments, we'll, we'll return back to Victor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ah. <laughs> uh, good, uh, good morning, Nigel Hickson uh, from ICANN. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, for the invitation to attend this open consultation session. And I think I've mastered the technology, but not sure. Uh, the comment I had was in relation to the, uh, to the excellent response that, uh, uh, that we had uh, in terms of the workshop proposals. It's great to see such a diverse uh, range of applications for workshops. But I, I think it will be very useful indeed to be able to uh, discuss this in more detail, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we might have some time on our agenda when both the, uh, the MAG uh, uh, par participants, which of course have done all the work on this, not necessarily the work in applying, but certainly the work in assessing, which I'm sure must have been a, uh, a, a resourceful uh, uh, issue, if uh, we can have a discussion uh, with both the MAG members and the non-MAG members to better understand how this assessment is, is, is carried out and the sort of things that are being looked at because I think there is a great deal of opportunities which I think we can perhaps discuss also this afternoon when we look at the wider strategies that are going to be discussed at the retreat in how we can broaden the participation of the, uh, of the IGF in terms of the people that uh, take part, whether it's uh, virtually or in, uh, physically in the, in the annual sessions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Nigel. Um, before we turn to Victor, maybe we could move to a terminology which is community or community member. And if somebody is, obviously MAG members are part of the community as well, but if you're speaking in a MAG member role, identify yourself as a MAG member. And maybe we can get away from the non-terminology um, that way. So with that, Victor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, very uh, happy to uh, to share with you the, the 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 progress that we've been making uh, within um, the venue. Um, as I mentioned before, a very challenging one, yet uh, we strongly believe it's the the right one to host such an event. Um, a historical building, a UNESCO heritage uh, building, that's made um, very uh, interesting. Um, challenges for us to deploy even the engineering side all the way into the audio conferencing and, and video. Um, yet we are complying with all the uh, uh, requirements from UNDESA and, and from for, for the, to host the IGF. Um, I take into account, um, Marilyn, your comments around the uh, flexibility of the rooms. We'll, we'll try to, um, to put that into, into perspective and make that venue work. Um, I'm going to blaze through the slides um, in, in a swiftly manner. Um, we put a lot of photographs for you to actually start uh, leaving this, the, the venue itself, seeing the place, um, and of course, um, giving ourselves the opportunity to put in forward uh, more uh, feedback around the type of um, um, layouts that you would like to see within the, within the venue. Um, go ahead, please.
So we're not only going to be using the inside of, of the venue itself, but it's actually located within um, a, a very big square. So we're going to um, tent. We're going to uh, build a tent um, in front of it. So in that in that square that you're actually seeing, we're we're, um, we're going to build a, a tent for um, for for the um, the launches and and for to to build the entrance if you want, if you want Yolanda you can uh, you can you can skip every five or ten seconds of pictures because there's a, there's a ton of them and I don't want to um, linger on too much on, on on some of them We, we took into account um, the room requirements and uh, we're complying fully. Yet, of course, the, uh, the venue itself is not a conference center. Uh, it's a historical building. So with, it, with that, I really ask from you your, um, your sensitivity around you know, the, the, type of spa the, the type of spot, the type of place, and what we can do with it. Um, within that, it's actually quite a big uh, venue, uh, and we're making the best use of it. Um, yeah, I know, because it's, uh, it's not sliding. That's fine. What we can do is, I apologize for this, but um, what we can share the layout um, and actually share with you the, um, the, the how we're building the place um, from bottom up. We're going to have some, for example, on the on the main stage. Um, it's going to be flexible, so we're going to do the opening and the closing ceremonies um, to host around 2,000 people, and then it will actually change into a smaller um, session group. Since we're back, now. Hmm? We're back. We're back. <laughs> it's good. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, go forward, please. So those are the requirements, as I mentioned, um, and um, hopefully you're able to to see on the next slides. Um, so it's very, it's a little bit difficult to see from the slide, yet um, on your left you see the entrance, and on there we're actually building the tent to have uh, additional uh, flex space, uh, more so to to be able to host uh, sponsors and sponsor events. Um, we're really trying to, act, to activate uh, the industry in a different way, meaning um, it's a challenge, as, as you would imagine, to invite sponsors and then don't uh, open the, uh, the, the place for, for branding. Um, in, within that, we're already in talks with most of the global um, ISPs companies or most of the glo global telcos, they're very interested and they've made uh, themselves, um, um, they, they potentially accepted or they accepted in, 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 in um, the, the invitation. So, so we're working towards that. Um, one comment, we've finalized the funding from the government side, so we're quite happy with that. More so in, in these times, um, you know, Mexican government has taken a hit budget-wise because of oil prices. So uh, I just mention it like that because it's taken, um, you know, triple time the, the work just to be able to fund from the government side. Now the next steps is actually to build the sponsorship um, pro, uh, program to invite the industry to be really active into that. So what we're doing in here is not only, of course, having the normal, I guess, um, presence from the industry, but select some of the venues and neighboring buildings to be able to, um, to open those for the industry to present their cases and, of course, to share with us what they're doing around um, internet development. Um, so. Of course, you've seen what Google and you know companies such as AT&T AT has have done before. We would actually um, we are seeing more of an active engagement within the industry that will not, uh, of course, overlap with the agenda that we're setting up towards the, to, to, for the IGF. Right. 
Um, we're, as I mentioned, we're making use of the square um, as a flex type um, space. So on your left, you're seeing on the red side the, um, the, the tent that we're going to be building there. So that will become the entrance. And that's where the village was going to be um, hosted, as well as the food court. Um, I'm uh, because I, I give good news, but I also like to to uh, to advance on some some not that good news. But we haven't been able to secure um, free food yet. Uh, we're working very hard, as I say, but um, and it's on our best, uh, of course, um, interest to be able to to provide us with with food within the spot. Um, nonetheless, it's going to be very, very um, cost efficient uh, to be able to, um, to, to stay within the venue, don't move around that much. Um, but of course, as you would imagine, everything, every peso or every dollar cost, so we're, um, we're very um, sensitive around that. That's the main entrance uh, to the building, and um, we're proposing the MAG uh, a slightly different registration process. Of course, we'll be inviting ourselves to pre-register so we can actually pre-print um, the, uh, the accreditation IDs and the packages, uh, and we have them ready to go. Um, the experience that we have in many events, even IGFs, is that, of course, on the first four hours or three hours of the event, there's a big bottleneck but really the registration or the entrance is not used that much afterwards. Um, we would like to focus a lot on those hours via um, some newer accreditation and printing mechanisms. We'll be uh, testing those out and of course asking your, for your feedback as to how you um, see this um, happening in the most efficient way. Of course, it has to, this has to be approved by the UN's uh, security detail. Island. So you can see the village area. Uh, once getting into the building, the venue, there's a registration. Um, so you, we're already inside the, uh, the building itself. Now we're very, uh, the building from the inside, uh, more so on the first day, we can actually get lost. Um, it's big and it looks the same, we call it. So in is the east wing or the west wing, it actually looks exactly, exactly the same. It's very symmetrical. So we're uh, putting a lot of effort into signage around the, the, the place and also for, um, for inclusiveness um, with braille um, signage as well. We're going to be uh, um, putting some signage on the floors. The, this is the main conference area, so it will, on the opening and closing, as I mentioned, it's going to be, it could host up to 2,000 people. Um, and that's an actual photograph of a similar event hosted just last year. Um, we're going to be uh, putting some, some um, cover. Uh, Mexico is a strange uh, country. It's really monsoon country, so it doesn't matter. Rain season, it's, it's all year long. So um, even though the weather is it's actually quite, um, quite warm and quite nice, it could actually rain at any moment. So um, we cannot um, avoid that. Um, that's the main pr um, proposal for, uh, for the main conference hall. The, um, the layout could change, so please don't. Um, so we would like to put a bigger screen, of course, to, um, to allow more, more things to be uh, projected. And this one can act, will actually change into um, the main meeting room um, shortly afterwards. So as you, as you can see, we're trying to make the best use of the space. Um, and, uh, and of course, without compromising 
um, the, the, the content itself. Within the museum section, we build the bilaterals. Um, we believe it's actually gorgeous. It's going to be gorgeous. We're thinking about putting an exposition and exhibition at the same time, so we'll be able to hold bilaterals at the same time um, as enjoying some contemporary and historical Mexican art. So on, on the orange, on the um, top left, you'll see the uh, the bilateral. Um, mini rooms. Each of these hosts um, different size rooms from uh, 16, 24, 39, 40, and 47. Um, I deeply apologize because we should have put the UN's flag, yet my, my team put the US flag instead. Um, so, Mr. Masago. <laughs> Already mentioned that, and uh, and, then, and and of course he's right as 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 always. There will be a lot of UN flags and pins everywhere. Where there it has some patios um, uh, throughout, so we're going to be uh, using those for workshops. Go ahead, please. And of course, accommodating different size rooms. So as you can see, um, the layout is not the best one, and I say it with those words, yet um, the venue itself will present a very good opportunity for us to, uh, to, to blend uh, what, we, what we perceive, you know, the, the, his, the historical with the new. Um, nonetheless, we're, we're, we're going to be able to hold um, all the IGF requirements for those rooms. Um, the acoustics, we're working on that. We've already tested uh, some of the rooms. So, um, so that we can um, um, absorb some of that um, echo. Um, nonetheless, there, it's actually quite big, so it's not going to be um, a noise pollution in between the, the rooms that, w that we know. Okay. Um, to the media center. So media center, we're really thinking about to, to use this place either for press uh, or also to be able to, uh, to sit down and see all, everything that's happening in the concurrent meetings and select from different um, audios. So we're gonna, uh, our idea here is to have all the uh, screens that are uh, from, the, um, so from CCTV and being able to select audio. Um, of course, press can actually be here. We've used this uh, format in many uh, of our international events, and it's worked very well so far. Um, coffee throughout, very important. And, uh, and, and that's, that's going to be complimentary, coffee and... Um, So, um, so as you can see in summary, uh, the venue itself um, is beautiful. We're very proud to be able to have the opportunity to use it, to host it, and to uh, in, in, in this in, in this international event. Um, we believe it's even it presents a bigger case than even a conference room because it's a, it's a big differentiator. But really, in here, my ask is for your feedback as to um, how we can make the most out of this. Um, this uh, layout. Um, within that, I return to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, we have a few people in the queue, 
and um, I think we should save this for any sort of uh, specific comments here. And then um, if we need additional, more specific information, we could perhaps get that offline, share it, so that we have that in advance of our uh, more detailed discussions tomorrow morning. Um, but Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Victor, for the update. Uh, two quick points. One, I just want to encourage you in the statement you made in your opening comment about using the meeting to enhance the local community activity. You said the voices are strong, but there's a lot of development work. I've had a long relationship with ICANN, which deliberately positions its meetings around the world to do just that, to bring internet governance issues to communities. Against some opposition from some members of the community thought that the meetings might be better if they were constantly hosted in major centres, but we found over the years that the advantages to the communities where the meetings go. Uh, so I want to encourage that, tell you that it will work if you can do that. There are advantages from having there. And to offer any kind of help that you need with that, um, one of the things that, again, looking at the ICANN experience, the chairman, the CEO, luminaries from the technical and business and intellectual property and social uh, civil society, members that come to those meetings are, are used to go and give presentations, talks, etc., in the local community. And if we can help do that so that we don't just all come and go to the meeting and then go home. If there's other contributions that people can make in the community, I'm sure you'll find people are very willing to do that. Um, the second point is um, one of the things IGF's done, I think, is establish a, a very high bar with some of its programs, like the meeting, the agenda, and keeping track of the sessions. Can we, can we add to that and move to a GPS or near field technology, particularly if you have a region of a, a, a space that's confusing. There, is, there are developing software programs for conferences where members can find out where to go, what's happening near them, you know, the GPS and near field technologies available. Can you look at those sorts of programs? They are very helpful, not just for the people attending the conference finding their way around. They're also very helpful to the organizers. You get records that track where people went, how long they stood, where they, you know, there's useful organizing data as well. If you could look at some of that software, it's available, um, you can get it for conferences, and if you've got a venue which is confusing, it might be a big help. Uh, definitely. And uh, the, the, so I uh, appreciate your uh, willingness to, uh, to, to support. Um, of course, I recognize ICANN's role uh, globally. And uh, the way that they set up the conferences is definitely a best best practice. Um, within that, of course, we uh, we not only uh, um, welcome the support, but also uh, my ask here is in different ICANN meetings, um, um, incoming one and the Helsinki, we were um, active there to be able to bring the Mexican IGF story and be able to invite more and more people, really engage more um, the the way that we're looking at the really giving ourselves a more of a value uh, value prop around the use of technologies um, we're developing an, an, an application for the for the venue itself for the event itself um, of course we're are, are we're hopeful that it can include NFC um, if not, um, I think Wi-Fi would, uh, would be able to, um, to give us a lot of that um, uh, value. Um, also, what we've seen is um, a lot of uh, consumption for live stream even within the, the venue itself, which, will, which actually consumes a lot of the bandwidth that you can get. Uh, I used to say that if you get 10 gigs, 10 gigs will be used. Um, so within this case, we're thinking ahead, trying to set up um, in-house um, CDNs, content distribution networks, so that we'll be able to, even from this, the app itself, um, be able to see what's happening on other, on, on other places, on other um, uh, meetings and workshops without going to the internet and back, because that definitely we, uh, would, would, would choke the bandwidth. Um, so we're thinking about all these things. Um, the other, the other uh, project that I would like to mention, just because we're, we're very conscious around the use of the budget and, and, and the budget towards the event itself, is that we're thinking of the, the, the infrastructure built towards the event 
uh, it's going to be a permanent infrastructure to the uh, venue itself. So we're going to be tendering, tendering that to a, sponsor, a potential sponsor uh, to really deploy a state-of-the-art Wi-Fi network that not only serves you know, for those four or five days, but can actually serve um, for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the longer term. This will allow us to actually deploy uh, a bigger, stronger uh, Wi-Fi network and really think about what else can we do with that, with that infrastructure. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you. We actually have about four or five people in the queue, and if these questions are specific to kind of MAG responsibility for doing the workshop in terms of venue, I'd actually request that we keep those to tomorrow and we maximize the open consultation time on issues um, that really um, are in front of the community. I also need to apologize to Douglas because he's been in the queue as an online participant, but Shengatai and I are trying to work out a system here to merge the online and the uh, this um, speaker system here <laughs> in front of us. So Douglas, you have the floor, and then we'll come back to the um, few people that are in the in the queue. Sorry, but it seems that Douglas is not connected to audio, so maybe I can ask to type into chat and then I can read it. Can you give me two minutes then? So Douglas is going to put his comments into chat and um, Anya will read them out, um, in which case I'm, I'm going to the queue. I have seen a few people raise their hands, but um, you should try and do that through the system here so we can weave everybody in. Um, I have Cheryl in the queue just now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just had a specific question because um, I was a little bit confused. I know the word sponsorship was used. And I don't know that IGF has ever had sponsorships in the past. I know that companies contribute to the trust fund, and we really try to prioritize that to make sure that we keep the trust fund healthy. There are a number of donors in the room. So I just wanted to better understand, because I was looking at the brochure, and it looks as though you have to pay to go to the gala. And so I don't know, has the check secretariat changed the whole format of the meeting where now you have to pay to attend certain things or have certain speaking slots and things? Because I've... I'm newer than most people, but I've never seen that done before. So anything that you could clarify on that would be appreciated. Thanks. Uh, yes, the, all the meetings are of a non-commercial nature. Um, so you can't sell workshop slots or whatever. I mean, the only thing you can sell inside is basically food and drink. Um, but that's within the UN territory. Uh, Within the venue, where the sec within the UN security perimeter, let's put it that way. Whatever happens in the sovereign territory of Mexico is up to them. Um, but for our purposes, nothing commercial goes on within the UN um, security perimeter. Yeah. Carol, you have a follow-up. just put you, on, according to my screen here, it's just put you at the bottom of the queue. So I guess if you turn your mic off, there is no immediate follow-up. But try again, maybe. Did... Yeah. Okay, it just came on. So I guess then, just as a follow-up, just so I understand, so then the gala is open to all. Um, so day zero events are not, I mean, you're not selling speaking slots for that. I, I think that's my question. I don't know if you answered it fully or not, or I don't know. Everything controlled by the Secretariat is of non-commercial. Uh, so all the workshops, all the giganet, or whatever happens there, uh, nothing is being sold. Um, if where people, I think there's no preferential treatment at all within anything that is organized by the United Nations. Uh, thank you, uh, Chagatai and Cheryl. 
Uh, Jim, you're in the queue. So what happens is when you indicate in the, that you want to be in, your lights turn green on your microphone, and then they should turn red. I'm guessing, trying to find the pattern sitting up here. Can somebody actually help Jim with the mic? Uh, Ah, there we go. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. Um, you talked about the registration process. My experience has been that the registration process itself has actually gone fairly smoothly. It's the security getting into the venue. Um, and I don't think anybody at the dais or in the room has control over that. But I would ask that we communicate to those who do to have more than four metal detectors for a crowd of over 4,000 people. Uh, three of which are only available to general attendees and one is dedicated to VIPs. I think that was a serious choke point last year. Uh, hopefully we won't have as, uh, as, a, as a pasty white person standing in the sun for that long. It was quite difficult. So, uh, Secondarily, just to pick up on a point earlier um, and to relate a story to those who are new to the IGF and to the MAG, I do think, like the idea of having a, a multi-purpose room, so to speak, for new and innovative sort of formats that could be decided on the spot. If you go back to the IGF that was held in Nairobi several years ago, um, there's a story told of a workshop that didn't happen because the organizers didn't actually show up to the room. Yet it turned out to be one of the most innovative, engaging, and exciting workshops because the people who did show up for the workshop in the room sort of made it happen on their own. Uh, so I think that's a lesson to build on and certainly would look forward to, you know, that type of outlet for folks who want to organize on the go. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to close the queue with the remaining three speakers that are here and then move on to the next item so we ensure that we get um, a broad overview of all of the activities during the IGF week. So I have, unfortunately, it's just listed as access now, and I can't actually see who that is in the room, so if you would... Take the floor and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Um, Nick D'Agostino from Access Now. Um, I just wanted to say off by start off by saying that I really admire like the selection of the venue that reflects the kind of cultural heritage and the character of the host country. Um, I mean, the internet is a very globally diverse place, and so I think the venues of the IGF should reflect that, and so I think that's really great. Um, given the fact that 20% of the proposals that were sent in were uh, breakout group discussions, and that another 25% were others, I'd ask that MAG to consider this when selecting and accepting workshops, um, to kind of look at what rooms are available and what sessions really flourish in the format of the rooms that are available to them. Um, I think that there's a, lot, a really good chance to um, really accept a lot of more innovative uh, formats, um, which is what, what, you know, through the process uh, of the workshop proposal system this year was encouraging. So I would like that to be continued um, throughout the whole process and the acceptance. Um, and uh, lastly, I think in terms of the registration process, I just want to echo what gentlemen earlier um, said about the, the main kink point is generally in like the security um, and as somebody who worked uh, IGF registration in the past I think that one of the, the that's generally the, the main uh, sort of kink point is through the security um, and not necessarily on the um, printing of the registration process but thank you very much thank you Nick one of the um, <laughs> my next speaker is number 83 now, I have no idea who 83 is, and I'm assuming that 83 doesn't know who 83 is either. But <laughs> your, as your light mic has just turned red. Thank you. Thank you. It's just went red, so this must me be. Hi, uh, Zai Jamil from Pakistan, business uh, uh, law firm. I, I just had a question. I think it's, it's uh, seeing that the developing country like Mexico is stepping forward to do this. It's hosted many other events like ICANN and others before, so I, I, I'm really um, grateful for the Mexican government to try to do that, especially the event. The, the venue also looks like an interesting venue, especially um, 
focusing on the culture and diversity that exists in Mexico. But I had certain questions about the sponsorship uh, uh, information that's circulating. Um, what we've received as packages is that um, apparently um, you, you will have dinner slots. To, you need to buy dinner slots uh, for three people or two people if you want to have it. That's what the brochure says. And there's a branded bus uh, um, uh, process outside, and um, there's, there's a um, uh, speaking uh, panel uh, uh, on day zero. And, and so, so, so I was a little con uh, confused about which aspects are going to be part of the, sort of as, as the secretary uh, described, would be inside and not branded, and ones that outside might be branded. And what it raises the question about is, uh, does that create two competing markets for sponsors? Uh, one who wish to give money to the trust and not be branded and not be seen versus a, a opportunity for sponsorship outside a certain parameter. And to some extent, I think many of the sponsors might choose to do the other and not the first. Uh, and that, that creating that competition between the two, because I think we always have uh, tried to promote funding the trust fund as opposed to some other things. So getting some clarification on how that's going to work it would be helpful. Um, uh, because I think at the end of the day, some business is going to ask, why would I contribute to a trust fund when I can get better visibility on the infrastructure outside? I can have the branded bus and everything else. So some clarification would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think it follows uh, Cheryl's um, comment and question as well. Um, so the, the, the basis for the packages that we built, really, um, came from... The, the perspective that the government could not sponsor it all. And not because we, uh, as government, uh, couldn't afford, afford it because, uh, and we cannot, uh, but the reality is being a multi-stakeholder event, we thought that it has to be a multi-stakeholder approach uh, into everything. Now, so we're, uh, we're asking, for, asking for support. Um, yes, it's framed in a, in a sponsorship uh, package because we need to uh, to settle settle it down that way. Um, but we we have the, the 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 perspective to to really activate the industry in a different way. We know the global players. We know that they uh, are interested in in supporting the trust. We know who they are. We know who they bring. Uh, and that won't change. That's part of the mag itself. That's part of uh, even the the way that they. They are um, um, interested in contributing towards towards the Mac. Well, we, well, our effort towards day zero is really to bring in uh, not only uh, high-level ministerial, um, you know, people that we're used to seeing in the in, in day zero events. Um, yet we would like to bring in as well um, high-level industry specialists. Um, the way the way that we've been able to do so before is. Uh, with a lot of caution around brand usage and a lot of effort into really what those companies think around internet development and employment and so on. So, you know, you're familiar with Facebook internet.org. So it's one project that they're, they're, it's their answer towards, you know, certain um, um, gaps that they see. And if they're interested, they, they can come and... and and share with us their experiences. You've seen what Google does as well um, in terms of not only um, sponsoring or supporting the event itself, but they have spin-off uh, events or cocktails later on that they, uh, that they bring in, uh, where they can bring in you know, the usual suspect or slash bin surf to let us know what, how the internet is, is developing. So what I don't, we don't see it as a competing uh, mechanism. We see it as enriching and also activating the regional and national landscape. Uh, we usually, usually don't see the local players, and by local I mean, for example, American Mobile, which is one of the largest telecommunications companies in the planet and owned by one of the wealthiest people in the planet who also is Mexican, but they are not active in the conversation itself. So we're making those inroads and we're, um, we're, um, we've been do they um, successful in approaching those companies and really activating the conversation because Mexico really needs the, that debate to happen nationally and regionally.
Maybe you can try turning your mic on and off again. To admit we're losing an awful lot of time to a sophisticated mic system. Oh, okay. Just no, just a quick follow-up, and I know we've lost some time already. There's a difference, I guess, between corporate events, which corporate co companies can host, versus branded events, which is uh, sponsored events, which is where a government or some other group is having an event that's been sponsored. I think that distinction is very important, and I and I and I do think that um, still uh, the the multi-stakeholder model would require parity. And here it seems like then sponsors will get priority, which is not necessarily. I mean, I could be wrong, but it's just some thoughts that are being that are churning. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's not the case. Uh, really, um, the uh, the agenda will be set here. The the and you'll have complete visibility. The other parties, we're really asking for support from the industry because we believe it's 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 definitely valuable. Um, am I getting an echo or somewhere else? Um, still, you'll have even if you if you want to, you'll have um, um, we can share with you the percentages in which we're contributing towards the event itself. Um, I don't know if that will help alleviate your concern uh, in a way, but we we've been very um, uh, I guess um, conscious around how much should government even contribute towards this event, and not only because. We're hesitant to do so, but also because in events on the, of this nature, uh, if we try to overreach as government, we get um, uh, a backlash from civil society groups and so on that we're doing too much. I don't know if I'm being um, blunt enough but, or candid enough, but the reality is that we should only do so much. And then everything from, of course, what you're familiar with, which is agenda creation, all the way into how we interact with the industry should be said, or we, we perceive should be said in that way. Just um, one comment as well. In the last MAG meeting, we did agree that the MAG would actually see the list of open forums as well to ensure that they were um, complementary, and that was based on some experiences we had last year. That um, call for open forums is still open, and as I understand it, actually remains open for quite some time, but we will check in on it periodically, which would also perhaps be another um, step to, to reassure some of the, the folks here based on the comments. I have four people left in the queue, and then we're going to move to the next session so we can get through. I have Marilyn Cade, number 131, Ginger, who's online, and Zena, and we're closing it with Zena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to speak very quickly. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'm going to speak very quickly about some of the things that have happened in the past because I think if you haven't attended all of the IGFs and set through all of the planning, some things may appear to be very new. Um, let me first of all thank the Mexican government host for all the work you're doing and for the innovation that you're showing in reaching out to the um, multi-stakeholder community to develop. Um, the necessary support. First of all, just to remind everyone that although free food was introduced for some of the IGFs, it has not been at all of the IGFs. One thing to think about might be uh, not having free food but having a number of concession stands where people could bring food in and sell it. And I think most of us would respect that and be happy to uh, pay for a sandwich or water, etc. And that might move the issue of free food um, aside. A second thing I'll just remind everyone of is we were hosted in Europe not that many years ago, and the buses were uh, scheduled but not paid for. And if you took the bus, you bought a ticket. Not a big deal, uh, but it meant that that relieved the host country from having to prepay a lot of money to buses. Um, I will also just say that in another meeting I've gone to uh, from an IGO, um, there was also an effort to do a special deal with uh, taxis 
to have a special fee. You could pre-purchase tickets for taxis and pick them up at your hotel when you checked in. So that also reduced some of the costs. The attendees bore the cost, but they were also getting a special discount. Finally, I'll just remind all of us that we did go to an IGF not that many years ago, which was funded largely by um, stakeholder contributions, uh, some quite significant. They were not in any way viewed as being uh, um, giving special attention, and they, were, they came together to support what the local community could provide, and we had a very successful IGF, and I know this one will be as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd just like to underline that um, f the, uh, free food is not a requirement. Transport, pay tra I mean, free transportation is not a requirement. It's just that the government should ensure that there is adequate transportation to and from the venue. Um, because here we are in New York, it's just the same type of rules. We pay for our transportation to come here and back to our hotel. Yes. Thank you. Those are good points. Um, the next speaker in the queue, with apologies, is number 131, and I can't see a lit mic, so I don't know who that was. Did... Marilia. Yes, Marilia. Your, your, mic, your mic is red. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, it's not working. Yeah? Okay, thank you. So uh, I just would like to, to say that I, I do appreciate the, the attempt to clarify uh, the, the commercial science in the venue, but another point that I think is very important, important is public demonstrations of opinions. And I'm sure that you remember in the last IGF there was a group of civil society activists that were conducted a public protest, uh, a peaceful one, and the, the signs were torn apart. And there are um, um, report, concerning reports that they were um, henceforth monitored or forbidden to access the venue. And this is very concerning. I believe that for, for next year, something that maybe we should look into is to have a clear uh, policy that is made available and clear for IGF participants. And if demonstrations like this happen again, and sometimes it's very hard and to control them on the ground that UN personnel is instructed how to react uh, properly and, and not in an exaggerated manner to these demonstrations so we can preserve uh, freedom of opinion and expression of IGF participants. Thank you. Thank you, Marilia. We have Ginger in the queue. Ginger, can you try to speak now? Ginger Pack, I'm a MAG member from Civil Society. Um, can you hear me? I am speaking. Can you? I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, we can hear you, Ginger. Just a lag. I do not see the captioning capturing me, so I am not sure. Uh, we can hear you, Ginger. Okay, I am confirming now that you can hear me. This is Ginger Pak from Civil Society. I consider myself as representing the Americas, that includes South America, Central America, and North America, with all of our mixed priorities, but really a multi-regional effort for inclusion and access. And um, with that, I would like to express my appreciation for the efforts being made to include online participation. I know it has not been easy for you this morning, and we, it is indispensable, and we do appreciate it. Um, I very much appreciate the host country's efforts and the explanations that we've been getting of what's, what's being planned. This is very important as we prepare. And in the spirit of the uh, inclusion and access, and in the spirit of what Rita sped, said early this morning, Rita Sharma, about underserved and underrepresented groups, including newcomers who do not have always the support of established groups or uh, colleagues who have been already in the venue, 
I really think we need to emphasize a space in a large booth in the village square for a newcomers and information booth. I'd like to see full discussion on this and I think it's an important point for people who do not have a way to join in, exchange ideas and get support for being involved and for the voices that are not being heard and don't have support to, to group together and, and get uh, organization and groups. So I would like to uh, ask that we please discuss and firmly commit to uh, a newcomers or information booth and center. This may take care of some of the um, problems with alternative voices as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ginger. It's a very important point. Zena, you have the floor. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Zena Buhar from Lebanon. I'm a MAG member. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Victor two questions because uh, in, the, in the previous meeting we mentioned the uh, uh, mobile app regarding the, the, the forum this year and we, mentioned the pos we discussed the possibility of launching a social media competition to, un to encourage the youth to, uh, to get involved with, the g with governance issues. This is uh, one question. I would like to know if the, you are considering this as, uh, as a host uh, country. And uh, my other suggestion is uh, based on our experience in, in the Arab IGF, uh, we established booths on the, in the airport two, three days before the start of the meeting. So whenever people from abroad are coming, they can collect their badges at the airport or even uh, sometimes we send them the e-badge uh, with the QR code. Uh, they, they can print it and bring it uh, along with them. It will facilitate uh, too much from the burden you'll, uh, you'll face at the registration desk. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, the UN registration is uh, tightly controlled by the UN security. So, I mean, um, Victor has his proposal, we have to pass it through the UN security. They really like, before they issue the badge, they really want to check your ID and your particulars. Um, it, it's just a security protocol that they follow. So it's going to be a bit difficult. We, go, we are trying to modernize them, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I had tried, <laughs> apparently unsuccessfully, to close the, the queue after Zena some time ago. I have three speakers left. We're sort of significantly behind in the agenda. Um, I will give the floor to the three speakers, but really ask you to be um, fairly succinct in, in your comments so we can move on to updates on from best practice forums and the connecting and ena enabling the next billions. So with that, um, I can. Nigel, you have the floor. Aha, uh -huh. it's gone red. I'm getting there. What it is, Madam Chair, in, in where I come from, it's green usually that signifies go and red stop, but I, I, I know that's uh, rather... Uh, <laughs> not the case everywhere. So, uh, ju ju just very briefly, and thank you, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you, Victor, for, that, uh, for, the, uh, for the outline of what's going to take place in Guadalajara. Certainly, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to uh, uh, return to Guadalajara again. It's, uh, it's going to be a, a great opportunity. On the, uh, on, on, on the discussion we just had about events that are sponsored or not, and uh, I, I, I appreciate that this has to be a, uh, a multi-stakeholder approach, as you, as you rightly said, and it's only right that uh, people should uh, contribute, and I think, uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, Marilyn got it quite right, and no one... No one minds paying for uh, dinners and buses and, and things like that. The, the, the only thing I would, I would say, and perhaps this has already been clarified, that in terms of the day zero agenda, I know uh, that you've kindly asked uh, uh, for, for, if you like, uh, for ideas and contributions on what might uh, take place on the day zero and for uh, ideas. And we'll, uh, as I can, certainly be putting in a, uh, 
a, a contribution to hold a discussion uh, on the on the iron oh. transition, and uh, and I, I I think one would hope that 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 agenda itself is 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 not uh, is not linked to the sponsorship. Obviously, there might well be side events as as, as happened at other IGFs which are, which are sponsored, and of course that's absolutely up to you. But it, it would be nice to know that the uh, that the day zero agenda as, as, as such is, uh, can be applied for on the basis of sort of merit and interest, which of course is up to you entirely on what is considered to be uh, meritorious. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Nigel, just a quick clarification. Um, the day zero event will be on, um, it is always managed between the host secretary and the host country. It will be on the basis of merit and things such as the ICANN workshop or the GigaNet workshops, et cetera will have no relationship, no impact to anything um, the Mexican hosts might do um, with respect to any of the other events on day zero. I think I can say that quite unequivocally, and Victor is shaking his, his head. Um, the last two people in the queue, I'm sorry, again, the numbers are number 82 and 129. Both your mics are green. I don't know which one is the next one in order, and I'm afraid that'll mess up the system, but since yours yeah. just turned red, sir, I yeah. guess you were the next one in. So, hi, hello. Uh, I'm Marcel from Google, and uh, I'd just like to clarify that Google is and has always been a major supporter of the IGF uh, through the financial support that we give to the trust fund, to the robust participations of Googlers themselves in the wide range of panels, and to stipends to civil society across the world. But uh, uh, just to clarify, all of the side events, all of the extra stuff that Google does or does not do at the IGFs in general has nothing to do with sponsorship packages or any kind of extra payments to the host country or, any, or anywhere else for that matter. It's just something paid by Google itself. I just wanted to clarify that because it's a different uh, uh, way of putting things. I don't want people to think that in the past Google has paid anything extra or different for hosting those extra side events. Thank you. I completely agree with you, um, and of course, hosting that uh, the side event has um, you know uh, Google invested some money into doing so. What we're what we're attempting to do this time is to collaborate within that format. So these side events will happen. What we're doing that is presenting uh, the industry with some options so that these side events can happen in a better way, in a more uh, in a more um, valuable way, if I can say so that way. There are, for example, many ven venues, neighboring venues, as I mentioned, that will not be, you, uh, any company would, would not have any access without government support. So we're doing that in a way that we can collaborate with the industry and the industry actually sees that as valuable. We have been in conversations with Google already at the public policy uh, uh, level, so uh, at, at, um, at the OECD meeting, and they have expressed their interest into contributing in such a manner. Um, just one uh, uh, clarification, the branding will not be in any way inside the venue. And that we will continue to keep the spirit into, uh, that the IGF has, has had. Um, we have no interest and no uh, into uh, uh, um, tampering with that, but we would like to strengthen, of course, the surrounding area so we can do so that way. Zina, very quickly, yes, to the mobile app, and yes, towards engaging more our youth to, to the, uh, th through the use of social media for capacity building, so we can talk more about that. Thank you. I've just been given another update on the system here, and in order to help the mics work properly, I need to announce the speaker specifically as is marked on your sign. So, for instance, if ICANN has asked for the floor, and I know it's Nigel, I should not identify him as Nigel, but as ICANN, because that is what's marked on the placard in front of him. Um, so maybe that will help speak some things up. So I now have number 129 in the queue, and I know that's Lori, but 129, you have the floor. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, members of the MAG, I'm Lori Shulman from the International Trademark Association. I'm following up with a suggestion on welcoming newcomers and perhaps embracing those who may not be as, vo as vocal or as, as active as perhaps some of us are in other venues. And I would strongly recommend and consider a mentoring program. I envision this where you could have a sign-up desk with newcomers who come in and say they'd like to be paired with a mentor at least for the first day to learn the ropes and then have people more veteran sign up as, as volunteer mentors. It could be done very smoothly, very easily, and I think it would foster a lot of good conversation. 
Thank you, Laurie. Um, so I'd like to take just this opportunity to thank Mexico for everything they're doing. I think it's going to be a really exciting and energetic conference with a lot of energy um, based on some of the things we're seeing in the proposals and here from the MAG. I think it's in an absolutely beautiful place. And Victor and Yolanda have worked very, very hard to meet all of the requirements and, in fact, go beyond in, um, in many ways. So, you know, I'm very much looking forward to a really successful IGF there, and thank you. So the um, next um, item are updates from the IGF best practice forums, and then I propose we go to the IGF policy options for connecting and enabling the next billions. So I'm not sure who is prepared to speak on the updates from the BPFs. Is that the secretariat, or is that some of the... So Michael Nelson, you have the floor. Izumi... Just very briefly, um, the Best Practices Forum on Internet Transparency and the Fight Against Corruption is finally getting going. We had a useful conference call about a week ago, had a critical mass of about nine people, including a couple of experts from outside of the MAG community, outside of the Internet governance community, uh, one of them from Access Now. We've also had someone from OECD quite interested in her reaching out to Transparency International. We are in the third draft of our mission statement, and uh, we'll get a, a new version out probably tonight. And we plan to have an informal luncheon discussion on Thursday to finalize this and to also continue our outreach to uh, the people who are engaged. There's a lot of interest, and I think we have a pretty clear agenda on what we want to do. Um, so I thank everyone for their support, and anyone who wants to talk, come and find me. Uh, we're also setting up a listserv so that people can sign up for and be part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, all the best practice forums in DCs, there's information on the website for all of these. So if people are interested in following or participating, you can find the necessary um, information there as well. Izumi, you have the floor. Update on the Best Practices Forum for um, Encouraging Environment for IPv6 Adoption. And as I've been um, updating to the MAG members, the focus this year is on the economic element. Um, I think we've made quite a good progress so far in fixing the goals and scope of our group, as well as um, having the draft structure of the output document, as well as the general timelines. I'd like to um, emphasize the importance of outreach for the Best Practices Forum uh, in two perspectives. One is to make sure that we uh, we get relevant input from a uh, wide range of stakeholders. And the second is that once the, uh, the output document is ready, then again, we're able to reach out to the, um, the target readers of the document. And I think one of the great things about having the best practices forum in IGF is that you're able to reach out to the people who you, you don't usually have the reach on a particular issue. So in the context of IPv6, we have good reach to the technical communities, but for this year's focus, we would like to reach out to the people who make um, business decision or be able to collect the business cases. For example, uh, from companies such as Apple, Google, um, or um, companies that have deployed um, IPv6 on access lines, but not from the technical people, the people who make the dis a business decision, what is the economic incentive behind um, IPv6? And I would like to ask for support from our MAG colleagues on reaching out and helping collect the case studies as well as the analysis on um, how certain economy is more successful in IPv6 adoption than the others. Thank you. Thank you, Izumi. I, I think that's a really important point, and I would like to make sure that um, people did hear that in that particular, the IPv6 best practice forum, they're really looking as a very significant portion of their next phase to engage with uh, the business community, specifically. The technical work is mostly done. 
um, they're really looking for case studies. So I really would encourage um, MAG members to use your own contacts and um, see if you can help support that work. Advancing IPv6 um, will support all of us um, very well in, um, in, in advancing the internet. Um, next in the queue, I have IGFSA, which is Marcus Kilmer. Marcus, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. And building on what Itumi said, I think I would also emphasize the importance of outreach. We had three calls so far, and yesterday a call for contributions was posted uh, on the IGF uh, website. Uh, the uh, idea so far is that the experts involved agreed that this needs to be seen as a multi-year project as the issue is so broad and also that we should not try and reinvent the wheel and duplicate with what is already done in other organizations but focus on the core competency and the core strengths of the IGF that is bring people together from different organizations and focus on coordination, cooperation. And uh, we have a dedicated listserv with close to 80 people on it, participating with a good range of experts who are not regularly involved in MAG, work and open consultations. But with this, I would also call on MAG members and other interested people here in the room to subscribe to the list and to engage in the discussions as we go forward. And lastly, maybe a horizontal issue, the question whether we should have a synchronized approach as regards to various deadlines or whether we should let the individual best practice forums go ahead within their own rhythm. We thought we would need at least three to four weeks now for the contributions and have thought of setting a deadline of mid-August, but we are obviously open here to listen uh, as how others feel it. I think most important perhaps is that we all agree then on a final deadline when we all issue our report for final comments going ahead for the Guadalajara meeting. And that should be well in advance, at least one month ahead of the annual meeting itself. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I know Jack and Sala have put their hands up to report out on their best practice forums. Um, so let's start with Sala over here. We need to wait till your mic is lit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is uh, Sala, Sala for the record. Um, I bring greetings on behalf uh, of uh, the other co-chair, Douglas Anyango, and the BPF to the MEG and also to the broader community. And... Um, one of the things we wanted to do was to go back to the, as a BPF, one of the things we wanted to see was to do was to go back to the original mandate of the BPF in terms of aligning our activities um, to the mandate. And noting that the, the report from um, ECOSOC Working Group called for an enhancement to enhance the impact of the IGF on global internet governance and policy Further noting also that uh, the BPF exists to enrich the global policy debate or global uh, internet governance. Um, we took an approach of uh, examining where, where we've been as a BPF. And uh, last year, uh, behind me is Wim, who's uh, our expert consultant um, who's, who's working closely with the BPF where the BPF took a general approach to producing a document. But also simultaneously, one of the things that's been happening globally, uh, on 3rd Feb 2015, th there was a council working group uh, by the ITU that had uh, consultations on um, uh, discussing the establishment of IXPs to advance connectivity, improve service quality, and increase stability and resilience. And as, as a result of that, there were resolutions reached where they, um, with it, where they talked about a cross-collaborative, um, there's a council working group on international internet-related public policy issues. For those who are interested, that's pertaining to resolution 1344. And the consultations were opened from 18th February, and it's still running and will be closed on 11th September 2016. 
So given that um, as a BPF we have the opportunity also to feed into global forums, um, it might be useful. I've, I've noticed that there are many of um, the many members, many organizations from uh, the broader community that have made submissions. It's already up on the website. So it'd be interesting to to see how um, how we could you know sort of um, synergize. Uh, some of the, the, the uh, pertinent issues. And um, following uh, calls that the BPF already has had, we're moving into defining a specific uh, scoping statement, a, a specific scope for this uh, year's output. And we'll be updating uh, the MEG and uh, the community through the mailing list. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sala. Um, Jack, you didn't get in the queue electronically, but I would like to pull you in now while we stare with the um, best practice forums. And I'm not quite sure what your name plate says. CG. CG. CGI.VR, please, if you could light that mic. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so this is Jack reporting on behalf of the Best Practice Forum on Gender, which I co-coordinate with Renata. Um, we've had three meetings so far. It's been really good. Um, lots of um, engagement and we've had new as well as existing members from the last BP participating. Um, so the, one of the first few meetings was really about defining the scope. Um, one of the things that came up was that it felt that it was a really good idea to have a best practice forum on gender as a broad thematic area in which uh, different dimensions then can be focused on in subsequent um, IGF, um, well, in subsequent years to ensure the sustainability and that it goes sort of like both broad as well as deep. For this year, um, Two things were agreed in terms of the scope. One was to ensure that the best practice forums, uh, last year's best practice forum on countering online abuse and um, gender-based violence, um, that we would keep the outcome document as a sort of living document and some conversation about how do we do this, to update on new, um, new initiatives that has come up, as well as to look at um, opportunities um, to both, let me see now, um, look at opportunities to both um, extend the dissemination and the use of that document. Um, and secondly, to focus on gender and access as the thematic issue this year, as it linked very strongly also to SDGs. So there are two sort of uh, activities that have um, been identified. One is a mapping initiative. So we are mapping existing research and initiatives on gender and access. This is both to... Um, to basically determine whether there are any lessons to be gathered from the existing work as well as to identify gaps in work and research that the BP can work towards. And secondly, is to, um, the second activity is to have a kind of webinar as a way to engage um, greater participation and outreach um, as well as to also um, uh, inform people about the work of the BP. So the first webinar, in fact, is scheduled for this week and it, the webinars are also sort of linked to national and regional IGFs where possible, um, where there is um, discussions around gender and access. And um, that's a way to also make sure that there are kind of like link linkages between all of the different activities. So we really do um, welcome and encourage participation, especially around the mapping initiatives. It's really very simple. It's an Excel sheet that's up right now. So if you are um, aware or um, would like to make sure that work that's happening at different levels around general access is included as part of this conversation, we really do encourage it. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. So we've just heard um, report outs from some of the coordinators of the five best practice forums we have which um, rely very much on work of the community. Um, it's also a critical part of, of extending the IGF's impact and clearly was um, part of the recommendations of the CSTD, Working Group on Improvements to the IGF, which is looking for more concrete outputs. So the work is extremely important. As I said, it really depends on the community. Um, we appreciate all the support and all the time that's put into it. And I said all the information on those BPFs is on the IGF website, including all the modalities for participation. Um, but I want to thank everybody for all the time and effort they put in. That work has really come a very long way over the last few years, and it really is critically important to, to the success of the Internet and certainly very helpful to the IGF itself as well. Um, with that, um, I'd like to move to the next in the queue, which is uh, Constance Bommelier from ISOC, 
who will be speaking on the major intercessional uh, project that we have, phase two, connecting and enabling the next billions. Constance, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking all the MAG volunteers and colleagues outside of the MAG community who have uh, stepped up and contributed to developing um, the framework document that I will be uh, presenting today. As Lynn uh, mentioned, the best practices but also the policy options uh, for connecting and enabling the next billion have been developed um, following the CSTD working group uh, on IGF recommendations that were endorsed by ECOSOC inviting the IGF to contribute to the global internet governance dialogue by producing more tangible uh, outputs. Um, the work this year uh, with regards to uh, policy options for connecting the next billion has also been developed uh, bearing in mind the outcome of the 2015 Sustainable Development uh, Summit where uh, we have a very clear um, goal, 9C, calling for universal and affordable access for all by uh, 2020. Um, so you will remember that following the last uh, MAG meeting and open consultations, we developed a draft framework document to guide our work uh, going forward. Uh, we received many, many contributions, suggestions on how to tailor the exercise this year, uh, many uh, specifically coming from uh, the NRI, the national and regional initiatives, and I'd like to thank Marilyn and Anya who have really uh, help collect and uh, solicitate these, um, these contributions. Um, mainly what came out of the suggestions was a call to uh, take the policy options that we have identified last year, uh, and I will remind them very quickly, deploying infrastructure, increasing usability, enabling users, and entering affordability, one step further and looking at the regional national level, what are the specificities in terms of uh, market structure, level of capacity building, and so on and so forth, that needs to be taken into account as policymakers, the industry, civil society, work uh, together towards uh, fine-tuning these policy options. Uh, the second wish that came out of these contributions and suggestions was to try to connect in a more explicit way how ICTs support the different sustainable development goals. Um, there have been some suggestions to look at the full list, so the 17 sustainable development goals. I think with uh, this set a special emphasis on how the Internet and ICTs can uh, elevate poverty, um, uh, contribute to, to, to health and well-being, education, uh, and empowering women are clearly the four uh, sustainable ve development goals that um, were, um, were suggested the, 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 the more often. In terms of next step, now that we have this framework document um, that has uh, integrated the contributions and suggestions from the, the community, we will be reiterating what we have done last year uh, calling for uh, open contributions, written contributions. Um, the tentative date is end of July, but the reality is that last year we, uh, accepted, we accepted contributions throughout the year, bearing in mind that some national regional IGFs uh, may take place uh, later in the year. Through an iterative process, we will uh, develop a first draft and then a second draft that will systematically be open for comments um, through an online um, platform where anybody can uh, make some suggestions uh, in an open, transparent, and bottom-up fashion. Um, what we will also do is um, invite any MAG uh, colleagues, but also beyond the MAG, um, experts who would like to contribute to the drafting of these policy uh, options for connecting uh, and enabling, this is a word we have added in comparison to last year, um, the next billion. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. Um, again, that was a very significant piece of work last year and was in direct response to some of the requests um, uh, from various quarters uh, for improvements to the outputs of the IGF. Um, the next in the queue is Renata. Hi. I'd 
friends wanted to uh, Renata Quino Ribeiro from Brazil uh, from the BPF Gender and Access with uh, Jack. I just wanted to add also um, upcoming as the item about NRIs that um, we are having the webinar uh, today with IGF Brazil, uh, but also uh, we wanted to, to present the, the, BF, the BPF's work as well in the main session and uh, in the main sessions um, list. I did not see the BPF main session listed, so I was wondering what, um, what happened with that idea. Uh, this could be also addressed uh, tomorrow during the main session discussion, but I just wanted to bring it since we were talking about the BPFs as well. Thank you. Oh, no, it, it was um, excluded in error, and then I did send another one out with it um, in the PDF. Thank you. The next item uh, is uh, updates from the national and regional IGF initiatives. Um, again, those initiatives are obviously very central to the advancement of the internet for the well-being of everyone in the world. It's not just about the internet. Um, and um, we're very happy that there are 62 such initiatives at last count. And um, I think it's, it's um, also critically important in terms of enabling a lot of activities at the very local level. So I'm not um, quite sure how we're prepared to speak about this. I see um, a number of people have come in. <laughs> um, Marilyn Cade, you can have the floor. And then I have Patrick, European Commission and Council of Europe, and the list is growing. So I'll just keep the list going. Marilyn, you have the floor. Chair, Marilyn Kate speaking. Can I just clarify that what I'm doing now is an update on the NRIs, or are you looking for uh, comments from um, the floor about the NRIs? I'm prepared to do the update with Anya's help, or we can just take open comments if you prefer. No, I think an update would be very useful. Um, I, I know a lot of people are very familiar with the NRIs, but perhaps not their scope and reach. So I think a, a brief update at the top of the discussion would be useful. Thank you. Marilyn Cade speaking. I'm presenting the summary update on behalf of myself and Anya. And um, I want to also want to acknowledge that in the room we also have Yusa and Sala who have also volunteered to work with us on enhancing the engagement of the NRIs. So this is going to be just a very quick overview of the work that has gone on since the um, uh, IGF uh, uh, in 2015. I'm going to uh, then post the uh, document to the MAG list. Um, but Anya and I need to insert a map in it, so I need to, first of all, get that map inserted. So let me first of all start out by just giving a few statistics that are important to understand. NRIs did not exist as a concept directly called for in the Tunis agenda. There was reference to working at a national uh, and local level, uh, and the NRIs began to grow up after um, the Internet Governance Forum itself, uh, planning began. In 2011, for instance, we had 12 regional or sub-regional IGFs, 23 national IGFs, and two youth IGFs. In 2016, we have 14 um, identified as regional or sub-regional IGFs. We have one that has not met for several years, and we will be uh, talking with them to see if they intend to stay active. But we have three new sub-regionals in formation, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and North Africa IGF. Uh, that means that, and I want to congratulate the African region, that means that we now will have sub-regional IGFs across all of Africa, as well as national IGFs and, of course, the continent-wide IGF, the African IGF. We have 40 nationals that are in existence right now, and we have two to three new that are in formation. When I use the term in formation, that is in space formation, meaning they are just beginning to plan or have yet to fully um, put forward their plan for the IGF that they intend to hold. We have five youth-affiliated uh, IGFs. They're all quite unique. Um, I won't go into a detailed discussion. 
During the um, IGF 2015 at the substantive session, the NRIs themselves made a number of recommendations. One was to double the number of IGFs uh, by 2017 to add in a dedicated focal point. I'd like to comment um, my and express appreciation to DESA and to the IGF Secretariat and to welcome Anya in returning now as the dedicated focal point. We also agreed to create a self-developed and peer-reviewed toolkit. We in agreed to increase the networking horizontally across the NRIs to host a uh, collaborative booth at the IGF, to propose a main session at the IGF, and to establish a way to increase the way that the national and regional coordinators can find each other when they go to um, other events. We will have an NRI informal dialogue tomorrow during the lunch period. The details for that will follow. It is primarily for the NRI coordinators to continue work on the main session and their IGF engagement. It is, of course, an open meeting and open to observers. There will be a separate NRI information discussion that I wish to um, just mention that Yuso Sala, Anya, and I will be able to organize with any of the new initiatives who are working toward a new event. Now, I'd just like to comment about we have held uh, bi-monthly calls, and we now hold the same call, topic-wise, in the same week, but in two different time zones, so that we're not so unfriendly to any part of the world. Uh, out of that, we have taken a uh, survey of the way that the NRIs would like to conduct the proposed main session. I posted that main session, um, and I won't go into the details here, but just to note that it is published, and we do have the support of the NRI coordinators. We will, of course, be looking for MAG feedback, and then we will continue the planning uh, with the NRI coordinators for their main session. Out of the discussion and the survey, the NRI coordinators have also expressed interest in a separate sort of admin management type sharing session that could include the IGF secretariat and the MAG chair and suggest that that perhaps could be held at either um, on either day zero uh, or if not enough are there, it could even be held over the lunch period. It would be an informal working session on their part. Finally, work is underway on finalizing the, we do have a request for a booth, work is on, underway on finalizing how it's going to be staffed. It will be shared with the youth IGFs, and while there are some initiatives who will have their own booth, there are a significant number who are interested in a shared booth. The, we intend to continue the um, ongoing bi-monthly calls, and we hope to have a, um, once the MAG uh, accepts or provides comments on the main session proposal, then we will undertake to finalize the way that that uh, main session will happen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think that was a very useful report, and thank you to everybody who contributed to it as well. So, Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Patrick Ho. I'm a new MAC member. I'm from the China Energy Fund Committee, operated out of Hong Kong, China. And I would like to put in a plea for, the, for developing countries and a national uh, re and regional forum uh, for the developing countries. And Madam Chairperson, when member states in the Tunis agenda requested the United Nations Secretary General to convene the IGF. They also called for efforts to strengthen and enhance the engagement of stakeholders in internet governance mechanisms, particularly those from developing countries. They further requested this forum to advise all stakeholders in proposing ways and means to accelerate the availability and affordability of the internet in the developing world. At the same time, the Tunis agenda also called on us to contribute to capacity building for internet governance in developing countries, drawing fully on local resources of knowledge and expertise. In this spirit, Madam Chairperson, I want to highlight the need for us to do more to strengthen and enhance the engagement of stakeholders in global IGF convened by the United Nations Secretary General through national and regional IGF, particularly those from developing countries. 
Indeed, this request was reiterated last December by the United Nations uh, General Assembly high-level meeting on WSIS Plus 10 review, during which member states recognize that there is a need to promote greater participation and engagement in an internet governance discussions, including relevant stakeholders from developing countries. Member states called for strengthened, stable, transparent, and voluntary funding mechanisms to this end. The China Energy Fund Committee is an ECOSOC accredited development think tank, and it is our philosophy to promote sustainable development for all, especially the disadvantaged groups through sound public policy. We also strongly believe that strengthening the national and regional IGFs is a cost-effective way of capacity building, and where we pledge to work closely with national and, and regional IGF in Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Asia Pacific area, because that's the area where there's the greatest growth of internet usage will 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 materialize in the very near future, and that's the area where the efforts to achieve the sustainable development goal will be the um, most apparent, uh, especially in attaining sustainable development goal number one, eradicating poverty. And we are ready to work with partners to explore further options and initiatives for supporting national and regional IGFs. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, next in the queue is the European Commission, Christina. And um, while we're getting the mic lit there, uh, just remind everybody that, in fact, we do have French interpretation here as well, if people would prefer to speak or listen in French. Thank you. Christina, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Is this working? Yes. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Monti uh, from the European uh, Commission. I would like to take this opportunity to um, briefly uh, report on the recent uh, European Dialogue uh, on Internet Governance, Eurodig, which took place in Brussels on the 9th and 10th of June um, under the theme Embracing the Digital uh, Revolution. This was the ninth edition of Eurodig, and it was hosted by Eurodig, uh, by, I'm sorry, by Eurid, uh, the .eu registry, in cooperation with the European uh, Commission and with the involvement of all Eurodig uh, partners. Approximately 700 representatives from government, business, technical community, civil society and academia gathered in Brussels to address internet governance and policy issues, including internet privacy, security and access. Uh, during the event, uh, a number of keynote uh, uh, speeches were given by um, high-level speakers like uh, the Commissioner, the European Commissioner Oettinger, who covered uh, digital single market aspect, uh, data flows and data protection. Also, the Commission uh, Vice President ANSIP intervened uh, and he uh, talked about the European Union vision on, of internet governance on the basis of a thriving digital economy and the development of the digital single market strategy. He also addressed uh, the current efforts uh, from the European Commission for removing geo-blocking. Uh, we also had high-level participation from other um, partners like the Council of Europe. The Secretary General uh, Jagland was there and he uh, spoke about protection and promotion of fundamental values and rights in the digital world. Um, we had the Foreign Minister of Estonia who spoke about human rights and the rule of law on the internet and cybersecurity including the important balance between privacy and security. This is just to give you a, a, a feeling and a sense of the, of the kind of issues that were very uh, topical in this year's Eurodig meeting. We also had uh, other high-level participants, including the ICANN CEO, um, and we were lucky enough that uh, uh, the meeting coincided uh, um, with the announcement by NTIA uh, that the uh, IANA stewardship transition proposal meets the uh, required uh, criteria. So that was a, a good coincidence. Uh, and we are, we are also very pleased to see um, you, uh, the MAG chair, also participating actively in the Eurodig and the uh, and, and Shanghai from the IGF secretariat. Um, and uh, in general, uh, there is still a lot of potential that could be uh, used from Eurodig and 
create better synergies and linkages with the, with the IGF. So your presence there, I think, was very, uh, very useful. Um, I would also like to mention uh, that uh, um, this edition introduced a, a nice innovation, which was the um, Twitter wall. I know that uh, some MAG members were discussing about the possibility of using this also for uh, IGF. Um, I think it was really uh, nice and it provided a, an interactive uh, element which was appreciated by, by participants. Uh, and so if, if this is something that uh, the MAG members are considering for the IGF, uh, maybe it, would, it could be useful to also get in touch with the people uh, in Eurodig who uh, took care of this uh, particular aspect. Um, Finally, uh, just to mention that this edition uh, was important to raise the level of awareness about internet governance issues in uh, Brussels, in what we call the Brussels bubble, which sometimes is very focused on European Union activities, and so this is something uh, positive. Um, when uh, um, now um, um, concrete messages are uh, going to be drafted summarizing the discussions that uh, uh, were held in uh, Brussels and these messages will be transmitted to, to the IGF. And in terms of next steps, um, Eurodig uh, key partners and supporters are reflecting on how to take full advantage of this uh, multi-stakeholder bottom-up platform at pan-European level um, and to further um, use the full potentiality of this platform. Um, one particular aspect that I would like to highlight is that um, uh, Eurodig could be very useful to also debate emerging issues like uh, Internet of Things, blockchain technologies, challenges of the sharing economy, and I think that this is something that also the IGF could uh, uh, consider. Um, and this in addition and beyond uh, the uh, specific um, focus on ICT as an enabler for sustainable development goals. In Brussels, the discussion was really a lot about digital economy and the transformation that is bringing to our societies and our economies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. It really was a very good event and the discussions were very high level and I think in part because there was such a good diversity of participants, um, certainly government, civil society, technical. So it really was a, a very good event. Uh, next in the queue we have Council of Europe, Lee. Thank you Madam Chair. This is just, thank you Madam Chair. This is just to echo, um, as one of the partners of, of, of the Eurodig since the beginning, um, this just echo what uh, Christina has said, that it was a very, uh, very good event. And to say that um, it also brought together, uh, I think we, in Europe there's over 25 or maybe 28 national and regional initiatives, which is probably the more, more initiatives in one continent than any other continent. And there was a lot of pre-events and side events to, to mention. Um, and uh, we, had a, we had a special event, uh, which actually Anya and I chaired, uh, moderated on, on national and regional initiatives, which was very, very good. Um, it's driven also by partners. I mean, there's a cloud of partners around the Eurodig as well. Uh, this includes the Commission, RIPE NCC, uh, Council of Europe, uh, and several others. And it's very important that they support this and to dr drive it forward. Outreach is also done by them. I think that's a good best practice. Um, there, were, there were 39 events uh, organized over the, over the two days, or the two and a half days, um, based upon 132 proposals for different workshops. That's quite a lot. Um, and so that, that's, that, that's really the base on which we, 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 uh, we started at EURIG this year. Um, looking forward, uh, EURIG will take place in, in Estonia in 2017 for its 10th anniversary. Uh, the date has not been set. Uh, and uh, there will be, just jumping, jumping back to now, we have messages from Brussels which will be conveyed to the IGF 216, uh, which are being, being prepared th at the moment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Right, thank you, Lee. Next in the queue is Egypt. Christine, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, I, I would like um, um, to um, um, th thank all colleagues uh, that have advanced the intercessional work and acknowledge the big effort that they've been doing, uh, whether uh, the best practice forums or the policy options for connecting and enabling the next uh, billion. 
And uh, I think uh, it's, um, uh, those are very important efforts that um, enhance the impact of the IGF. And there was so much effort put into uh, engaging stakeholders in that uh, intersessional work as we move towards the yearly meeting, especially going organically through maybe um, uh, national and regional initiatives. But I think what we need also to think about, and maybe this could be done while we uh, work intersessionally um, to design what we are going to do in, uh, for those uh, uh, initiatives is that we uh, also focus on how can we market the output, uh, those outputs when they actually come out of out of the um, out of the yearly meeting. Because this thing, this is something that we're missing. Although there's so much effort being done, I believe uh, the the impact organically is not as big as it should have been. And um, for that, I think we should um, maybe uh, align with national and regional initiatives to go to them with the output possibly in their, um, uh, in their preparatory uh, phase uh, uh, after the yearly meeting or even in their uh, yearly event that follows uh, the IGF. But we could also uh, maybe target uh, uh, the diplomatic circles in Geneva, in New York. Um, and uh, I think we should also go with those outputs uh, to the regional and, uh, um, um, and uh, national events or international events that go across the region like um, ICANN, ITU events, and, and, and so forth, uh, MENOGs maybe. I think it's very important that we do this step because unless we go for that, the impact will remain restrained within the IGF community. Thank you. No, thank you, Christine. I think those are, are very good points. I, I think there's a lot of um, different requests that come through for what we can do to make the impact um, much more significant on the ground. So I think those are some good, good comments. Uh, next in the queue, I have Juso. Juso, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam. Ch Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to add to the previous speakers, that as uh, chair of one of the Nordic IGFs, the Finnish IG, the Internet Forum, um, I used the convening power of the Eurodic to organize a, a discussion among the Nordic IGF initiatives on uh, improving our coordination and cooperation towards a possible Nordic IGF in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Yuso. And I've just been reminded my, by my Finnish learning colleague here that it's Yuso, and <laughs> the J is silent. So thank you. Um, I attended that meeting and thought it was, um, was very useful. Uh, I have Zina in the queue and then Jivan. Zina, you have the floor. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Uh, I just want to give a brief uh, uh, status of the Arab uh, regional IGF. I uh, just would like to I actually uh, to announce that the, the ESQA and the League of Arab States already uh, proposed a new initiative, which is the AIGF 2020. And the technical uh, uh, working, technical cooperation working group uh, has been established uh, just for the enhancement and imp improvement of the Arab IGF. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, Jivan, you have the floor. Red go. <laughs> no. Um, I just. Uh, just to repeat something that we've been discussing before as well, and that is that um, there should be a more coherent effort to connect uh, all of these uh, initiatives in some form. Uh, nothing structured, not, nothing too structured, but at the same time, just the fact that most of them are um, going over common issues. And, and the thing is, perhaps in one region it, it's going to be this year, but in another region those kind of issues will come up on a, at another period. So it's a good way to reconsider what has been already considered. Um, and a good way is perhaps a questions and answers, so that perhaps at the end of an IGF, the issues, the questions that pop up should be structured in some way, at least a part of the report. These are the questions that were unresolved, such as the issue that was uh, raised by Zumi earlier about the fact that the business community can contribute a lot to IPv6 discussions. So those kinds of issues formulated at the end of an IGF to be considered next year at binational, regional IGFs, and then those, each of them to contribute to next year's IGF with some thoughts on that. And perhaps 
the you know when the a formal discussion around them on uh, comparing experiences. So I think that that kind of question answer cycle can provide some kind of a, um, a loose framework to discuss common issues and to uh, put them in a, in a given context and then to provide a, a way to discuss them across regions. Thanks. Thank you. I think those are some very interesting comments as well. Um, I have Marilyn in the floor as the last speaker um, for this particular topic here. And then we will move. Thank you, Chair. Marilyn Cade. Speaking uh, as the substantive coordinator, I, I just want to respond to some of the comments that have been made because I think um, uh, perhaps it would um, be useful for MAG members who are not themselves directly engaged in the NRIs to um, have an opportunity to read the reports that we uh, post from all of our calls. Some of the issues that have been raised are very much on the minds of the NRI coordinators and they are discussing how to better um, reflect into the IGF and how to reflect from the IGF into the NRIs. We chose that term uh, after much debate in multiple um, substantive meetings of NRIs over several years, addressing the fact that there is no hierarchy, but there is a very strong interest and a very strong engagement in the, between the NRIs and the um, IGF itself. So I just want to comment that that work is underway. I flashed past the idea that we are uh, trying to increase the horizontal networking. We called for the creation of observatory where the NRIs could post um, concepts and uh, uh, calls for action that they themselves have developed, perhaps share uh, their version of best practices about tools and resources. We've also uh, now been, um, very thankfully, we see that Anya has been appointed. And uh, I just want um, to point out that the development of the peer-reviewed toolkit will now begin to take place. So. Um, Perhaps one of the things that we'll be able to see by the NRIs having their first main session at the IGF is how some of the comments of the MAG members are also being reflected in the work of the NRIs. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. And I think reflect is a, is a good word. Um, I also want to thank, before we move into the DCs, um, all of those that are involved in the National Regional IGF initiatives because it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, they're very important to the work we're all doing here, but I also know they're one of the first go-to places um, when the IGF is actually looking for participation, support, or ideas. So I, mean, I think I want to acknowledge all the work that they're doing. Often that's in a, in a volunteer mode, um, but it is critically important, certainly to the richness of the IGF, but also to um, impact at a, at a local level. Um, with that, we'll move to the agenda item on dynamic coalitions. I assume it's some combination of Marcus and Avery that are going to speak. So Avery, you have the floor. Thank you. Avery Doria speaking, a MAG member, uh, assuming I can be heard. So I actually don't have that much to report, and, and I don't know how many of the dynamic coalitions we actually have with us that may want to say something about it. Um, there are 16 of the dynamic coalitions now, most of which have sort of this bottom-up construction that work in their own way. But the dynamic coalition coordinating group has actually been working. It meets every three to four weeks. The schedule is somewhat ad hoc in terms of finding a good time when everybody around the world can, can actually meet and have put together a, a request for a, uh, for a slot on the main program, which I'm sure we'll be talking about in a different slot, so I'm not going to talk about that. But one of the things we have seen in the Dynamic Coalition Coordination Group is really a coming together, a working together, a finding a way to look for the issues that, that are common to, to, to them all. And so that, that's been very heartening because this is a group that really does work through the, the full year and is not really timed to the annual meeting, but it does target the annual meeting for reports. 
So uh, I think that that's pretty much what's going on. One of the things I do want to mention is that there's very strong support there for things like tweet, Twitter walls and tweet walls. It's something that they have incorporated in, in their program and, and such. So um, I don't know. Oh, yes, the other thing I did want to mention is they, they have decided together that they also want to apply for one of the booth spaces so that all the dynamic coalitions would be able to take turns and such being there and, and working. So very much trying to now integrate themselves into the, the, the program of the meeting. I don't know if Marcus has anything he would like to add. Uh, thank you, Avery, and I think that's really good news on the on the booth and certainly on the main session as well. I have um, number 224 in the queue. Oh, that's Mr. Chip Sharp. Am Chip? I audible? Is Am it I not? No. Am I audible? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Sharada. Uh, I am a research fellow at University of Pennsylvania Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. And this is my first time at a MAC consultation process. Uh, I've, I'm here to talk about the Dynamic Coalition for Innovative Approaches to Connecting the Unconnected. Uh, we are a very new Dynamic Coalition. Uh, we were convened earlier this year. The coordinators are Professor Christopher Yu, um, Michael Kendi, Helani Galpaya, and Rajan Matthews. Uh, I just wanted to report out on initial work that we're undertaking and uh, honestly make a call out to members of the MAG as well as the community that are here so that they can help us or if they're interested, participate more uh, in the work that we're doing. Uh, we are currently undertaking a literature review to identify potential case studies to try and understand innovative ways of connecting unconnected communities. So this goes beyond just the policy approaches that have been mentioned already. We're looking at on the ground solutions that are being implemented, and we are very interested in hearing about case studies, both by businesses as well as like innovative things such as community networks that are happening around the world. Uh, we are also looking at reviewing submissions that have been made to the IGF already uh, and seeing if, if there are potential case studies that we can document. We hope to have uh, some preliminary case studies that we can present at this year's IGF, uh, but we are looking to get more and more data and analyze it to be able to have uh, more information on these approaches, what works and what doesn't. So that's what we're doing. If any of uh, the people here are either working on similar issues or are interested in being part of the Dynamic Coalition, we do have a listserv. It's available on the Internet, uh, on the Internet Governance Forum website. Do join us and do have a conversation with me. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, next in the queue is 166, which I'm assuming is Chip Sharp. Chip, you have the floor. Next in the queue. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. I just had to wait for my light to turn red. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, since it relates to dynamic coalitions, uh, since it wasn't mentioned or maybe I missed it, I uh, just want to check so there will not be any uh idea rating sheets or uh efforts to endorse uh dynamic coalition output at this upcoming igf uh, that was a uh, discussion last year just since i didn't hear anything about it i assume that will not be a topic this year thank you yeah uh, thank you, Chip, for the question. So I will sorry. see if Avri or Marcus, Avri yeah, would like, like to respond. To Avri, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, part of the discussion will happen more when we are talking about the right program. Now, right? We um, are discussing using a form of, of the rating sheets, and, and we do expect there to be some output from the session that we hold. Um, haven't gotten to the point of actually talking whether we're looking for specific endorsement of specific DC's input. That's an ongoing conversation still within the DC coordinating group. But certainly there is a conversation about how we're going to use the, the idea rating sheet idea differently this time, use it earlier, use it such, but that conversation is still ongoing. 
but they are part of the program. And I guess when we talk about the program, uh, the, 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 the main session uh, issue, it will talk about more there. Thanks. Thank you, Avi. Chip, did that answer your quite specific question? I think Chip is indicating yes for now. <laughs> Uh, that brings me to the end of the queue, although I'll just do one quick double check to see if there's anybody online. Yes, if you allow, Thomas Schneider would like to intervene. Yes. Thomas, you have the floor. Well, it seems Thomas is not connected to audio, so maybe we can come to this later. Does he, would he like to wait or is he typing his comment in? Well, he's not typing anything, but I'm going to ask him maybe to send a comment and then I can read it. Okay. Um, somewhat astonishingly, that actually brings us to the end of the uh, morning's agenda. And I say astonishingly because we're actually 15 minutes early. Mm -hmm. Um, normally, we're quite pressed for time on those discussions. Um, so I can certainly give everybody the gift of 15 minutes of time, but before doing that, um, I'll just cover quickly the agenda for this afternoon and um, see if there are any final remarks that anybody would like to make. So we'll reconvene at 3 o'clock, uh, and for an hour and a half or so, we have an open discussion on the retreat on advancing the 10-year mandate of the IGF. Um, Wyman Kwok from Indessa is actually going to just say a few words of introduction. And then we're really looking for, you know, quite an open um, and I'm sure probably fairly robust uh, discussion as well. Um, after that, we'll move to briefings from other related or relevant initiatives or organizations. As I said, there were five or so that had come in um, with specific requests. Um, to give some brief updates on their activities and specifically where they think there might be some um, collaboration opportunities with the IGF. And it certainly is open for any other um, updates from the floor um, in a similar vein as well. And then that leaves 45 minutes at the end of the day to either continue with the retreat discussion if that is um, of most interest or if there are other topics that individuals would like the opportunity to um, bring up, then we will use that slot for that. Um, at some point during the afternoon, I will try and decide whether there are other topics that people would like to use that slot for, or do we continue on with either one of the other two agenda items, either the retreat or briefings from other organizations. But we'll take that call part way through, uh, through the afternoon. I'm just trying to check a note here. Um, yes. Um, so I, first, I'd like to thank um, all the UN staff for helping us sort out the mic system here. Um, I think it, it got better after we sort of calmed down and probably I was actually not using individuals' first names, but in fact the names on your, your placards. That signals which um, Mike to actually um, light up. So I want to thank them for all their support and uh, staff there. Obviously, I want to support the interpreters and the scribes. We do have scribing. Those transcripts are incredibly um, useful. Um, I actually rely on them a lot um, myself and uh, certainly the Secretariat, too, for all of their um, support and activities here. And now I'm looking to see if Thomas, if that has given Thomas time to put his uh, comment in or not. Yes, if you allow, I'm going to read his comment. Uh, just a second. Hi, this is Thomas Schneider from Switzerland. I just wanted to inform you about the national IGF that has probably a unique feature. At the Swiss IGF they, that was held for the second time this year in May, we had a one-day meeting with substantive three plenaries and two workshops. What is probably unique at the Swiss IGF is the fact that we decided in the multi-stakeholder steering group that we will not allow panels. We only have two to five minutes entry talks and then no panels. So we had the whole audience of around 100 people talking to each other, people from all stakeholder stakeholder groups, including members of parliament. And it was an amazing experience that everybody loved because there was a completely different dynamic and extremely rich in substance because with, the, with this format, many newcomers to the IGF daring to participate and share their expertise. 
This is in contrast to many sessions elsewhere where you have the same panelists talking almost all the time. This is an ins inspiration for how making sessions more. This will be this will be the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you. It does sound like a very interesting um, experience. I have Liesl France in the queue. Liesl, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, I suppose. Um, and I, at the risk of um, taking away two minutes of your 15 minutes <laughs> to give everything back, I just didn't know if you wanted me to um, provide just a quick overview of the, work, the main session proposals that came in. I noticed it was on the agenda, maybe I skipped my moment at the, <laughs> at the time, but I didn't know if you wanted me to provide that quick out, uh, readout. Okay. Um, just to, to thank you for everybody who, uh, to everybody who provided um, proposals for the main sessions. Um, and apologies to Ginger and Jack for not uh, capturing the, their proposal um, in the first go round. So thank you, Tai, for resending the proposal um, compilation. Um, there were nine uh, workshop, uh, main session proposals that came in. Um, I'll just read them briefly for the benefit of the transcripts and the open consultation, knowing that we'll probably have more of a discussion um, about them uh, later in the week. Um, the first is towards an interoperable global internet network solving current problems on cyber jurisdiction. Uh, cyber jurisdiction. The second is connecting the next billion phase two, as we heard from Constance earlier. Um, the third is sustainable development, internet, and inclusive growth. Uh, next is trade agreements and the internet. Next is the uh, proposal for the Dynamic Coalition's main session. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Um, and then um, shaping the future of internet governance, which was a, a proposal, a workshop proposal 179. Uh, next is assessing the role of internet governance in the SDGs. Next is the national and regional IGF initiatives main session. And then the ninth one, economic, social, and cultural rights. What are the implications for the internet and sustainable development? Uh, the compilation includes the proposals that people sent in with more information, uh, if that's, a, if to be sure to take a look at that. Thank you. Good. Th thank you, Liesl. That was a helpful intervention. Um, with that, I think we'll call the session close. We'll look to start promptly at 3 o'clock if we can, though. We have um, quite a number of very interesting and somewhat meaty topics. So I thank you all, and I will see you back here at 3.